Hello, my name is Nick Thompson. I've been in veterinary medicine for 30 years. During that time, the enormity of parasitic worm resistance to antelmintics has come to the fore. It strikes me that most of us are ignoring gut worm resistance to drugs. The problem, put simply, is that all human and animal dewormers face rapidly developing resistance. A helminth worm is a parasitic worm. An antelmintic is a dewormer drug. Bacteria are single cell microorganisms. Antibiotics or antimicrobials are drugs to treat bacterial infections. Resistance is the ability to withstand the effects of a drug that would normally kill or inhibit that organism. So why are worms so bad? Human parasitic worms can cause chronic gut disease in children and in adults. They can migrate to heart, liver, eyes and limbs, causing local as well as systemic whole body problems. Okay, but what does resistance really mean? Let's look at antibiotic resistance. It's the same story as antelmintic resistance, only better known. Here's an average human and an average horse. They both have a normal mixed population of mostly killable susceptible bacteria, but a very few resistant unkillable bacteria to any given antibiotic. If we give them a course of antibiotics, what happens? All susceptible bacteria are killed, of course, by definition. But equally, by definition, bugs resistant to antibiotics are unaffected. Unaffected bugs do two things. They proliferate and they can pass on those resistant genes to the next generation. Okay, back to our average human and our average horse to tell the story for antelmintic resistance. You'll notice that it's identical. Both infected human and animal have a mixed population of mainly susceptible worms with a very few resistant worms or helminths this time. We give a dose of antelmintic dewormer. What happens? Those worms that can be eliminated are eliminated, but those tiny few resistant worms do two things. They remain and they flourish over time to pass on their genes. Let's look at bacteria as a model of runaway resistance problems to help us understand what could happen with antelmintic resistance. This is a history of resistance of bacteria to antibiotics starting in the top left hand corner in 1928 with Fleming's penicillin. This, the first and most famous antibiotic, met with resistance in 1941 after just 13 years. Every few years since then a new antibiotic has been discovered and within a decade or two resistance struck, always. With every new antibiotic since, antibiotic resistance is inevitable. We know this from almost 90 years of experience with antibiotics. When commissioning the 2014 review on antelmintic resistance, David Cameron, then Prime Minister of the UK, said, if we fail to act, we are looking at an almost unthinkable scenario where antibiotics no longer work and we are cast back into the dark ages of medicine. Jim O'Neill, after two years of chairing the review on antimicrobial resistance, observed worryingly that one million people have died while we've been doing this review. The BBC reported in 2016 on the review saying, the global cost of the problem 
could be loss of 10 million lives a year by 2050 and $100 trillion a year at this point. That's trillion with a T. Antibiotic resistance has been described by the WHO as the single greatest challenge in infectious diseases today. This is serious stuff. But how do these dramatic predictions help us understand antelmintic resistance? Let's see. The UK Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency was quoted in 2016 saying, it is estimated that up to 40% of children under 10 years old in the UK may be affected at any one time. This product is typical of one used by parents up and down the country. The active ingredient is mebendazole, which unfortunately is also used widely in agriculture as a sheep and goat anthelmintic. Anthelmintics in agriculture are big business. According to the National Office of Animal Health in 2014, Antiparasiticides are 42% of a £601 million market. That is £242 million. That's a lot of doses of a relatively cheap product. Every single pharmaceutical dewormer used today has resistance issues with the worms they are trying to tackle. Taking mebendazole as an example, in trends in parasitology, even as far back as 2004, they quote, by the mid 1970s, multi-species helminth worm resistance to benzimidazole, e.g. mebendazole, antelmintics was common and widespread in both sheep and horses throughout the world. And these antelmintics are available freely to farmers, horse and pet owners, over the counter. The market is not restricted just to veterinary surgeon prescription, as in countries pioneering the combating of antelmintic resistance, such as Norway or Holland. Which means that extensive agricultural use is driving the development of resistant worms affecting farm animals and potentially your children, even if you are not using them for your children at that moment. Jim O'Neill, in the review on antimicrobial resistance, noted similarities between antibiotics and antelmintics, suggesting that resistance to antelmintics to certain shared human animal parasites has already become a major problem. As far back as 1997, MS Chan published a study, now quoted by the WHO, showing that the combined disease burden of soil transmitted helminth worms was as great as those of the killer's malaria or TB, tuberculosis. A DALI, by the way, is a disability adjusted life year to compare debilitating non-lethal infections. Hatem Halabi, in his 2013 review entitled Antelmintic Resistance, How to Overcome It, states that in Australia, the prevalence and severity of resistance threatens the profitability of the entire sheep industry in that country. And this is Dr. Ray Kaplan of the University of Georgia, USA, one of the most important vets in the world leading the fight against antelmintic resistance. He says that in the majority of the most important parasite species of sheep, goats, cattle and horses, multiple resistance is the new status quo. What does antelmintic resistance mean to us? How does it directly impact on our lives?
what will the impact of anthelmintic resistance be? Let's look at three main areas. Human health, animal welfare and economics. First, human health. As we've seen, up to 40% of under 10 year old children in the UK may have threadworms at any one time. This is not considered a serious problem currently, but they can be an ugly and uncomfortable, even life-threatening problem, according to the UK's NHS Choices website. Dirofilariasis is infection with dirofilaria worms, which can migrate alarmingly to any part of the body. Here we see where one has managed to penetrate the outer shell of the eye. Ascarid infection doesn't need to migrate from the gut to cause colic, cramping, weight loss and worse. Not to mention the shock if this lot lands in the bowl one morning. If resistance forces us to use more and more antelmintics, then it is inevitable that there will be more contamination of meat, milk and eggs taken from these animals. More food contamination, more potential toxicity to animals and to humans, which means more antelmintic residues in meat, milk and eggs which can promote resistance in human worms exposed to sublethal doses of wormer from food products. Low doses of drug are a major link in driving worm resistance. Withdrawal periods are delays after dosing animals before meat, milk and eggs can be taken for human consumption. A clearing period to allow the drug to leave the animal's body. They are designed to minimise animal derived contamination of meat, milk and eggs but they are not so stringent as to eliminate risk completely. They just reduce to an agreed level. In this slide, we can see some modern sheep antelmintics requiring as much as 104 days for antelmintics to clear the body. In cattle, the maximum is 66 days. But perhaps more worryingly, some products have zero days withdrawal even for meat. In poultry, the maximum withdrawal period of licensed products is seven days. The second area of impact of antelmintic resistance is on animal welfare. This is a pretty easy one to see. Worms cause disease which distress and can even kill our domestic species like cattle, sheep and chickens, for example. They can do the same for our pets, our horses, dogs, cats and chickens, and even our small furries like hamsters and gerbils may be affected by these worms. The third area of impact of antelmintic resistance is economics. Meat will become more expensive. Milk will become more expensive. Eggs will become more expensive. How? The answer is that worms will create reduced food conversion ratios, the reduced efficiency of the animal to produce those foods within them, will create more disease, will increase vet bills because animals are more sick, will force us into less intensive farming methods which will be more expensive will force us to use more wormers. So there it is, three major areas of impact of antelmintic resistance that will affect us directly. Human health, animal welfare and economics. So what can we do? The future of humans combating worm infections in us and our animals is in the balance. Well, well, let's see what Dr. Ray has to offer. Number one, he says only vets can prescribe antelmintics. 
a bit like antibiotics are prescribed currently in the UK, or how antimintics currently are prescribed in Norway and Holland, a very restricted prescription. Number two, vets prescribe according to strict preset criteria. And number three, and this is Dr. Ray's big message to improve what he mischievously calls global worming. He calls for the improved testing of antelmintics for efficacy and resistance. You can't tell if you're winning or losing the battle unless you can measure your progress. Hartem Shalabi, in his 2013 review, has come up with further suggestions. Only dosing those animals that need treating to avoid blanket dosing. Strict quarantine to slow the movement of resistant worms from place to place, country to country. And to think beyond just using anthelmintic drugs. For example, he suggests that there are major possibilities for more complex and sustainable recipes. For example, parasite resistant animal breeds, focus on nutrition, pasture management, nematode trapping fungi, anti-parasitic vaccines and, my favourite, herbal or botanical dewormers. My suggestion to reduce the use of antelmintics would be to require animal foods to be labelled with the drugs used in their production. Just as the declaration of E numbers and calories have caused a change in buying patterns, so a declaration of drugs in foods would reduce the use of those drugs on the farm. So the three problems with antelmintic resistance affect human health, animal welfare and economics. The answers to these problems are provided by Shalaby and Kaplan and many other vets around the world. We must act now to delay the inevitable tide of antelmintic resistance inching ever closer each day to avoid a sheep farm without sheep a grandson with no future on the land, as dramatically warned in this recent poster from the influential UK Animal Health Distributors Association. Thank you.